My purpose in relationship to the topic that I've got tonight, it took a detour a couple of weeks ago. When I, I made a, po a post on Facebook, I don't do that an awful lot, but every now and then I just, I have a, you know, sort of like the president, I get an itch to, twit, to tweet something. <laughs> and, and I put it on Facebook because I, I, just, I just had the thought and uh, when I did, it, it got some real reaction, and I, I, was, um, I was just fascinated by the reaction. I, I, put, a, I, I put a little, little, little thing, and I put it in quotes because nobody particularly said this, but this is said by a lot of people. And it was just the, the statement, if you're not a dispensationalist, you're not a Bible student. Now, that's the negative way of saying, if you are a Bible student, then you are of necessity a dispensationalist. If you're not following the program that God gave Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden then you're a dispensationalist. You recognize God's changed his program. If you eat meat instead of just being a vegan, you recognize God changed his program from Genesis chapter 1 with Adam to Genesis chapter 9 with Noah. If you don't eat bacon and catfish, then you're not following God's instructions to Noah. You're following his instructions to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Israel through Moses because Moses scandalously said you can't eat bacon, pig, pork, swine, and you can't eat catfish. If it doesn't have fins and scales, you can't eat it. Now, I don't know about you, but where I was raised, bacon and catfish, bacon grease makes everything better. <laughs> and frying catfish in it's even the best way of doing that. So, you know, if you're not doing those things, then you are, by definition, a dispensationalist. If you don't offer animal sacrifices for sins today, then you are a dispensation. So if you're going to study your Bible, if you don't avoid, avoid Gentiles today, you're a dispensationalist. If you preach the gospel that Christ died for your sins and buried and rose again, then you're a dispensationalist because the 12 apostles spent most of their ministry preaching the gospel of the kingdom and didn't even know Christ was going to die, be buried, and raised again. The reason that much of Christendom preaches a gospel of works without the cross work involved in it is because they're following people that preach just that. If, you're, if, you, if you don't do that, then you are, by definition, a dispensationalist. So it's part of, it's part of the, the, the warp and woof of being a Bible student is that by just the definition of being a Bible student, you are going to be a dispensationalist. Now, the negative way of saying it, and that's, negative statement is always the more powerful statement and turned out to be in that post. If you're not a dispensationalist, if you aren't recognizing those distinctions in the program of God, then you're not studying the Bible. That's the point. Now, I got a lot of blowback on that, and I was fascinated to get it. And what the blowback told me it demonstrated, it demonstrated the, the, the confused, weak need state of dispensationalism. Because when people can so radically misunderstand what you say, then somebody isn't telling them what you say. Some of your opponents are telling them what they say, and the majority of it is, is off base. So there's something about dispensationalism and really, when, when I look at it, over the past five decades, dispensationalism has lost its drive. If you go into the 18, late 1800s through the 1900s, the first half of the 1900s, the moving power, the, 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 the energy, and the so-called evangelical, back then it's called fundamentalist, now it's called evangelical movement, was the part of the church that is dispensationalist. That changed back in the, in the 60s and the 70s, and as the old guard passed away and the new guard came along, and you see a confused church, a confused evangelical church because of that. J.C. O'Hare made a statement in the, 50, in the late 40s. He says, if the, if, if the fundamentalists don't continue on with an understanding of the distinctive ministry of Paul, which is what the dispensational study had led them to, he said they turned their back on it, that the church is going to be scourged with the rod of Pentecostal fanaticism. And you've seen it happen. You live in that era today. The average evangelical church today is really an expression of the charismatic confusion. I teach a series. I have a set of teaching tapes on the, the charismatic confusion that I taught back in the 80s. And the, the uh, folks suggested that I update it. So I started reteaching some of that information a few weeks ago on, on, on our, in our Sunday night meetings. We'd finish one series and and I, and I started teaching it, and I was calling it the charismatic confusion, and somebody emailed me and said, you need to call that the charismatic craziness. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's, that's probably right. It was confusion, then it's craziness now. 
and it's permeated uh, the evangelical church. It permeated the evangelical church through music. You understand that? What we call contemporary Christian music is really Chuck Smith's Calvary Chapel in Southern California's Jesus Movement music that then caught on and worked its way through. Now, you might not know enough about music to know that, but that's something you need to think about. And the, the, uh, the charismatic influence, the source of it, and the fact that the church couldn't resist that and younger people in the church didn't have an understanding and an attachment to where their heritage was to be overwhelmed by that, demonstrates the, the weakness uh, of what's happened with, with, with contemporary dispensationalism. Some of the responses that I got were absolutely fascinating. Um, the negative posts that, 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 that you can go to my website, uh, my, my Facebook page and find these things if you can look it up. Where in Scripture can I find this? It doesn't, doesn't seem to, uh, I don't seem to know of any context which states this or even infers it. So somebody said, well, try 2 Timothy 2.15. Well, that's a great verse, but understand it in its context. Thanks. But that verse says nothing of dispensationalism or dispensationalist, right? Wrong. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Th this, is a, this is part of the nitwittery that comes along when you, when you study the Bible and you've got a point of view you want to pro pro project instead of what the Bible actually says. 2 Timothy 2.15, when he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God's word is true. That's not talking about <coughs> distinguishing truth from error. There is no error in the word of truth. You follow that? The modern versions translate that properly handling the Word of God. They got that, not out of the Greek text, they got that out of the Latin Vulgate. That's the Vulgate translation of that. That's a translation. By the way, you know who's the, pro who's the papa of the Vulgate? You just went back to Rome. That's not a place to get anything but confusion. There's no error in truth. He's not talking about distinguishing <coughs> error from truth. You're going to see that in just a minute in the verse. He's talking about taking the truth of God's Word and make the distinctions, the division that God has made in them. Now, there's no, the word dispensationalist and dispensationalism is not in this passage. Therefore, the truth of dispensationalism can't be here, right? Well, just keep reading verse 17. Their word will eat it of the canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. They haven't rightly divided the word. What'd they do? saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. They didn't deny the resurrection. They didn't say the resurrection is not true. There are people that said that. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, How say there, among you, there be some among you that say there be no resurrection from the dead? Thou fool. Woo. Paul didn't put up with that for a second. These guys aren't denying the resurrection. You know what they did? They drew a timeline and they put the resurrection at the wrong place on the timeline. <clears throat> They said the resurrection's past. The rapture's over with. We're over here. If the rapture's past, where are you dispensationally? You're in the tribulation. What comes after the rapture? See, this isn't brain surgery. If the resurrection's past, then you're back in the kingdom program. Grace is over. You're back over here. What, what's the problem that Timothy's facing? Look at chapter 1, 1 Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 7, verse 6, 1, 6. From, from, some which, from which some having swerved, that is from the sound doctrine they learned through Paul, verse 3, from which some having swerved, having turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers, what? Of the law. Is the law scriptural? Yeah, it's Bible. But it's not dispensational. You can be scriptural and not be dispensational and be completely out of the will of God. And that's what he's saying in 2 Timothy 2. They said the resurrection's past, that we're over here. You know what the program over here is? Law. You see where the guys are just saying, we need to go back and be under the law? Because that's the program we're under. What'd they do? They erred, saying, we're not in this program anymore. We're over there. What divides it? The resurrection. You follow that? 
That's the context of 2 Timothy 2.15. It is a dispensational context, and it is, that's one program, this is another program, we're under this one, not under that one, and if you get the resurrection at the wrong place in the timeline, you're... Eh. <laughs> I had a word I was going to use, but I decided not to. My wife will hear about it, and then I'm in trouble. <laughs> So the idea that 2 Timothy 2.15 doesn't contain the word dispensation, that's okay. I don't mind if you don't use the word, but it's certainly what the context is talking about. Put stuff, draw time. All dispensational Bible study is, is a timeline. That's why Paul says time passed but now ages to come. You know what that is? That's brain surgery. Woo! Hi, hi. That's time passed but now. That's, that's a timeline. And what dispensationalism, you draw a timeline of your Bible and you put things on the timeline where they fit. A dispensation is a dispensing. It's the noun verb of to dispense, to give out. What did God give out? He gave out grace. He gave out law. When did he do it? You put it on the timeline, the right place. That's all we're talking about. I, I don't find in Scripture where the term a word dispensation means a period of time. Who said it did? Dispensationalists for ages and generations have been saying it's not a time period. It's a particular set of it's a particular program. But look, that program covers a period of time. And if you get some of that program wrong and you say it's past, that's a time element. So there's a flat a time element involved in dispensationalism. But it's not, a dispensation is not a period of time. A dispensation is something that God gives out for man's obedience during a period of time. They covered a period of time. But the, what is the program during that period of time? That's the issue. And so they say, well, it's really a stewardship. And that's okay. God relates to people through covenants, not so-called dispensations. Covenants found 292 times in the Bible in 272 verses in the Bible. Testament, the same word, 14 times in 13 verses. Dispensations found four times. Shouldn't we use the one that's used all those times instead of four times? Because God relates to people through, dispensa through, through covenants. I'd like to see that verse. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. See, that's easy to say. Nice pontification. Quote a bunch of irrelevant facts. First, you misdefine what it is. One, you ignore the context. Two, you misdefine the term. And three, you just ignore something. When he says, God relates to people through, this, through covenants and not so-called, I'd like to see that verse. Because every verse you find where God relates to people through covenants, my question is, who are the people? Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember, the Bible is a... Is, is a <laughs> The Bible does to, to me often what I used to do to my kids when they misbehaved. I spanked them. My boys are here. It was a traumatic experience to get a spanking. You didn't spank your kid when you slapped him on the rear end twice and made him mad. That's why some of you can't spank your kids. You, you, you just make them mad at you. If you're going to engage your kid's sinful will and try to correct it, you better bring them to the place of what the Bible calls repentance, changing their mind about it, recognizing the wrong they did. If you're not going to engage in that, con in that contest with your kids, which is your responsibility, Daddy, it's not Mom's job, it's Daddy's job. And if you're not going to do it, you don't get in the war. You're going to screw that little dude up worse than he's going to be screwed up by having a derelict Daddy. Now, you didn't know you were going to get a conversation about parenting, <laughs> did you? <laughs> I never taught about those things till I had kids grown up. But I can tell you something about it. And by the way, Dad, if you need to know how to correctly discipline your child, you come see me privately and I'll give you an illustration. I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> and I don't mean that facetiously. And I'm not talking about abusing your children. I'm talking about helping your child learn to be submissive to authority. That book will do that. And every now and then that book will come on and spank you. And verses like this do this. Now, most kids don't enjoy getting spanked. I never did. I never enjoyed spanking a kid, my kids. I'm not going to spank yours. They might need it, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> That's your job. 
Look at this verse, Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you in time past, you, you being, that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. Why? Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. God never made one covenant of promise with those Gentiles. So the idea that God relates to people in those 292 times and the 272 verses, He's not relating to people. He's relating to the nation Israel. If you're going to quote a verse of Scripture and say you believe it, you need to be willing to believe the part of the verse that tells you who it's talking to as much as you believe the promise in the verse. Well, sadly, so many of you folks just want to exalt Paul. Above all others, saved by grace through faith, believers, and all were simply, you know, they were all simply. For me, I'll just take Jesus any time over Paul. Is that stupid that is? Now, you understand that's dumb. Paul said, I, I speak to you Gentiles as much as I'm the apostle of Gentiles. I magnify my office. God said to me one time, he said, you know, I just want to follow Jesus. And Jesus was baptized. I'm going to be baptized because Jesus was baptized. I'm just following the Lord in baptism. I said, which baptism did you follow him in? You know he had two. He didn't know he had two. Well, if you're so dumb you don't know how many he had, how you following him, and what, how do you know you're following the right one? You know what you need to do? Quit just listen. And I'm, I'm not trying to be unkind, but I'm trying to say, talk so you can un you, you understand what I'm saying. If you don't know he had two baptisms, a water baptism and then a baptism of death at Calvary, Luke chapter 12, if you don't know that, then you ought to quit talking about following the Lord in something that you don't know about and go get your Bible open up and find out about it. That guy asked me what the two were. I said, you go find out on your own. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> he never came back, but... He said, I'm going to follow Jesus. No, you're not. Jesus said, sell that what you have and give, it, give alms, give it to the poor. You drove up a car, didn't you? I need a new car. I'm trying to find a car to replace my, my old car. 18 years old. Needs replacing. Well, sell what you have and give it to the poor. I bet you got more money than I do, I bet. You're not going to do that. If you did, I wouldn't let you. You don't believe that. God says, well, he didn't really. We have a guy in our, in our group here in Chicago that did that. The preacher said that. He got saved. He got all excited. He went and sold everything. They had sold the rug on the living room floor. They're sitting there on nothing. His wife's thinking, what's going on? And he did that for about three months, and he quit his job. He's going to let God take care of him. And after about three months, he said, boy, this ain't working out. <laughs> if my mother-in-law didn't own the apartment building, we'd be on the street. And you know what he did? He said, that, that Christianity stuff is nonsense. And he spent seven years in the wilderness, and he just happened to meet a guy where he's out on, out on a job, and he happened to meet a guy, and, he's, and the guy tried to witness to him. He says, I don't want anything to do with that, and he told him about it. And he says, well, I got an answer for you, and he showed him right division, and it was like the sun came up in the morning for him. But he needed it. So people do it. That, that's just a bunch of talk. Somebody says, well, that was a haughty statement, and that's what I can't stand is the haughtiness. It's the message that comes through loud and clear. If you don't believe our way, you're in trouble. Personally, anything that is, that is far from the person and the work of Christ, I don't, want, I don't want. Well, I'd agree with that. But you know what that is? That's mistaking zeal and excitement of freedom for haughtiness. Now, you and I have to be careful about that. You get all excited. I'm free! And you want everybody, you remember when you got saved, how you tried to tell everybody? The night I got saved, nobody would believe I got saved. I started telling everybody I knew and they thought I was nuts. Because I was, I was real religious. You've had that experience. You try, and you have to be careful about people. Des talked about this morning. You have to have some gentleness, patience. Well, Des talked about it because Paul said it. Servant of God must not strive. It's easy to get into the striving mode. The difference between striving and contending is the motivation behind it. Servant of God must not strive. You don't, have, you don't have to fight to win. God already won. I learned I don't have to go to every fight to get invited to. 
My uncle used to say, I'll, drop, I'll fight at the drop of a hat, and if you're not careful, I'll drop the hat. <laughs> I'm glad I was raised around some people that said, let's don't drop the hat. Let's keep the hat on our head, keep a cool head, and let's just share what we know. Be patient. Somebody be patient with you. You didn't learn it all overnight, did you? First time you heard it, you probably didn't like it. I didn't. Servant of God must not strive. Be patient. Apt to teach. Get in the book. Get, be, get an aptitude to be able to teach things when people need it. Be patient. They're caught in the snare of the devil. By, but instructing, teaching. So that's true. And you have to be careful about that. We all make mistakes in those regards. But you know, when people respond that way, they're hell, they have a fear of your freedom and the joy that freedom gives. It's a strange kind of thing. This one I love. It says, this comes close to saying, if I'm not a dispensationalist, I'm not saved. Whoa. Now that's just the, uh, you know, I mean, it says that to you. How do you get saved? You get saved by believing that Christ died for you. You get saved by trusting exclusively in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior that died and rose again for you. And if you hear somebody say, if you're not a dispensationalist, you're not a Bible student, or if you're a Bible student, you are a dispensationalist, that's not saying it has anything to do with your salvation. It has to do with how you study the Bible. And studying the Bible is not how you get saved. A lot of people study the Bible lost on the way to hell because they haven't trusted Christ exclusively. So that's, that's probably the most dangerous statement of the whole bunch because that indicates a, a, a lack of clarity about what salvation is and how you get saved. But that's where you come when you get involved in the religious system that, 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 that binds you into that knee-jerk reaction. The one that I like the most and I think is the silliest, the other ones are pretty serious, so apparently, no one was a Bible student until 1830. Dispensationalism originated in the 1800s. What evidence do you have that other people interpreted the text in the way that way prior to 1800s? One of the first answers is, what evidence do you have that they didn't? You know everybody that taught everything? Where do you think you and I are going to show up in the pages of church history? You think church history is going to have a blazing page, Bible conference in Chicago in 2018. You're not even going to be a little bitty blimp of a footnote because the people that write church history are Roman Catholics and Roman Catholic sympathizing Protestants, and they don't put us in it. Go read church history. Go read contemporary church history of the last century. And if you get mentioned, you get mentioned with a, oh. have you ever read church history and read about the Polyseans that start in 600 and go to about 1200? I ran an article in the journal years ago about the Polyseans, and I got letters from, college, from grace preachers and from college professors saying the Polyseans were heretics. That's what Rome said. You're in agreement with them, but they weren't heretics. Everything you know about the Polyseans come from their enemies. They say, oh, these dreaded Polyseans, they followed Paul and nobody else in the Bible. Ooh. Anybody ever said that about you? Well, you know. See? They said, they didn't worship relics. They didn't water baptize. They didn't keep sacraments. I said, boy, who are those people? I need to know them. Sounds like some people I... They said they didn't believe that anything was inspired except Paul's epistles. Now, I've had people say that about me. It's not true. But you begin to realize, boy, there's some things going on there. And, you know, if you were a, a couple of years ago, Brother Brian Ross did a thing at our, at our men's meeting in April about the Paul of Sins, and you look at them and you find out, whoa, then you begin to realize why church history doesn't like them. They were a key element of the preservation of God's Word through the Dark Ages. And you know what they were? They were little groups of people just like you and me all through that period of time that believed salvation by grace through faith plus nothing, understood how to study the Bible dispensation. They might not have all the light you and I have. God help them. If we don't stand on their shoulders and learn more than they knew, shame on us. 
But you know, church history is not where you get this stuff. You know where it started? Paul. <laughs> it started in your Bible. Dispensationalism. This guy, I love this one. Even dispensationalists like Dr. Tom Ice read, or readily admit that dispensationalism came about in the 1930s with John Nelson Darby. It's just a fact. Now, it is true that the use of the term dispensationalism really got a popular approach in the 30s with Darby. But what Darby did was he put a modern name to something that's, all, that's gone all through the Bible. One of the most maligned, misunderstood concepts in, in the church today is the issue of dispensationalism. Many abandon it, used to be there, aren't there anymore. Others seek to redefine it, the progressive, uh, and so forth. You have people like R.C. Sproul, who call it, who called it, it, it and labeled it heresy. O'Hare's statement was right. When you abandon it, you see the results, the craziness that you get. Come with me. To, you're in Ephesians chapter 1. Look at chapter 3 just a second. And what I wanted to talk with you about tonight, I decided to talk about something else. Because I, I want you to understand how important it is what we do when we stand for God's Word rightly divided. When we stand for the clarity of the distinctive ministry of the Apostle Paul what people call, have identified as mid-Acts dispensationalism. I don't really like that term because Acts 9 is not mid-Acts, but it's not Acts 2 and it's not Acts 28, which is you want to be in between those two things. But the point is with the distinctive ministry of Paul, understanding that there came a dispensation. Listen, it's important to teach and understand and maintain that. And we may be apparently small, but you don't know everybody that's out there. We meet in our ministry constantly, people we never heard of. A pastor just recently out in the West, I'd never heard of him. He never heard of us. He came to understand God's Word rightly divided and has a church where he's teaching right division, and he just ran across one of our YouTube videos and about burst out as it seems, hey, there's somebody else teaching this stuff. A pastor down in Florida who led his Baptist church out of being Baptist, quit water baptizing, didn't know there's another soul in the world that did that, and he did it based on studying Romans chapter 6. There are people out there that you don't know, I don't know. Don't just think you know everything there is to know. God has his people. Jesus Christ can take care of the body of Christ. I'm glad I learned that years ago. It's not my job. My job is to take care of where I'm at in the body. But the body of Christ belongs to him, and he can take care of it. And he does. Thank God. i got some notes I'm going to try to go through and not... Not just preach. I look at that clock saying, i got to quit on time close to it because my wife gets, you're past 9 o'clock. We're in the nurse with all these kids. Okay, you got the idea. Ephesians, two ver <laughs> Ephesians 3 verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, would have that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Notice, Paul said, a dispensation has been given to me. Previously, nobody knew about that. Then they knew about something. So if he got a dispensation of this, they must have got a dispensation of that. You follow that? It's never called a dispensation back here. That's okay. It's called one here. I understand what that is. That's what right division is about. That's what you, you, you know the difference between law and grace. You know the difference between people at one place and time. You're not offering animal sacrifices. You're not trying to build a boat. Why? Because we recognize that the Bible is full of progressive revelation. The terminology Paul uses is dispensation. If you don't like that, well, you know, look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 verse 25 where if I was and made a minister according to the dispensation of God. So whose idea is it to dispense stuff? It's God's idea. According to the dispensation of God, which is given me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery. 
which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest. So the idea about it, 1 Corinthians 9, he says, a dispensation of the gospel is committed to me. Here's some information given to Paul that wasn't known previously, and God reveals it, and that's what's been that, that's where we are. We are under the administration of this program committed to us through the Apostle Paul. So when you talk about the dispensation of grace, it covers this time period, but you're not just talking about a time period, you're talking about the program that fills that time period. Now, when Paul talks about rightly dividing the word of truth, he's talking about making the, the most basic distinction in your Bible is between prophecy and mystery. You know that. I, I'm preaching to the choir here. Acts 2.21, 3.21, I'm sorry. Acts 3.21, Peter, right here after Pentecost, he says, what I'm preaching to you is that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. Paul said, this is the preaching of Jesus Christ from the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now it's made manifest. A six-year-old kid that flunked kindergarten can get the difference between that, even if your college-educated seminary going pre preacher can't. You didn't need to know anything about Greek. You didn't need to know anything about the original languages. All you need to read your Bible, and there it is, <laughs> difference. Something made known, something not made known. That's the most basic distinction in the Bible. A lady called me one time on our radio program. She says, Brother Jordan, don't you know anything beside those two verses? Because I talk about them every week. I said, yeah, I know a whole bunch more verses. You've got to get those straight first. And when you get that, we can move on. That's the most basic distinction. That's the fundamental issue. They're not the same. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, the basic issues that you have to understand are illustrated by this because here is a second dispensation, a different one, which demonstrates to you that the term dispensation of grace is not meant only for this, this, this program. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Having made known to us the, the mystery of His will, that's the Father's will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself. You know, that verse can change your life. It did mine having made known to us the mystery of His will. If God the Father has made known to you the secret of His will, is there any secret will of God you need to go try to find? Then why do you let these lugheads come along and tell you there's this secret unknown life map out there for your life that you can't know except you? This idea that back before the foundation of the world, God had this divine council meeting and he set all this stuff up and you don't know. Listen, he said he's revealed everything he did in that, that eternal life conference before the foundation of the world. It's in the book. It's been revealed. Oh, that verse isn't true. Oh, brother, do you understand the theological? I, I, I do. Been there, done that. Got liberated. You don't want to be liberated? That's on you. But you need to come to, verse with, come, come to terms with, with that verse. People say, well, doesn't the Bible say that I have not seen, ear, not heard, neither then the heart of man the things God prepared for them that love him? Sure does. But did you ever read the next verse? It says, but. That means that condition ain't true anymore. But God hath revealed them to us by his spirit. The things that you couldn't know by your eye, ear, or heart gate. God's revealed. You know what he did? He revealed by his spirit. Where's that? Verse 13 of first, I just quoted 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 and 10, in case you don't know. Verse 13, he says, by his word. You see, the spirit reveals by his word. Third verse in your Bible. Tells you how God's going to work. All, God, the Holy Spirit's going to work through, 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 through all through the Bible. In the beginning was, in the beginning was God. In the, the beginning was God. Paul said, I'd rather speak five words you get than 10,000 that you can't get. There's five you ought to learn. Those first five words of the Bible can change everything for you. There are people sitting right here tonight who are atheists. People say, you let them? We welcome all who come in peace. If you're a mid-Acts dispensational King James thumping believer that comes in anything other than peace, you ain't welcome. You're an atheist, you're a denominationalist, you're somebody, and you come in peace, have at it. I want to preach to you. <laughs> Those five words can change everything for you, one way or the other. In the beginning, God created the, heaven, created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was that form and board and darks upon the face of the deep. 
And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And he said. When God the Holy Ghost wants to move in his creation from verse 3 of your Bible all the way through the end, he works through his word. He doesn't work through circumstances. He doesn't work through hunches and impressions. He doesn't work. He works through words. I love that verse in Isaiah 22. Isaiah said, I heard him in my ear. <laughs> you say, that, oh, well, God spoke to me, not in an audible voice, you know, because we put those people in the booby hatch. But God, Isaiah heard it, heard it in his ear. God gave revelation. But there came a time when he finished that, put it all in a book. So you and I, you know, I don't know what Isaiah heard because he didn't write it down. He said, God spoke to me. Did you write it down? I'd like to hear what he said. <laughs> if you don't write it down, you'll forget it. Yeah, you know you. I'd like to know what it was. So God wrote it down. Isaiah 30, he says, write it in a book, put it in a table, that it might be preserved for the generations to come. I want to read it too. So he put his word in a book, made a permanent form of it. You've got it in your hands tonight. There it is. God speaks to it. So you have the revelation of that information. Now verse 10, here's, what, here's, here's the issue. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, so there's going to be a dispensation, a time when, when, when what God created time to do is brought to fruition, the fullness of something. What's he going to do? He might gather together in one all things where? In Christ. What things? Both of which are in heaven and on earth, even in him. Well, what's in heaven and what's in earth? The companion verse of that's Colossians chapter 1, verse, verse 16. Put that in the margin by that verse so you can find it. By him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible. What things? Thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. God didn't just create a physical world. He created some living creatures in that world to govern that world. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers are talking about governments over territories. And in your Bible is a whole structure of information about how God took and put some intelligent creation, creatures in control of his universe to exercise his will through. When Paul wrote that, he had all of his Old Testament in front of him that, that talks about that. And he says all of that is designed to accomplish God's purpose in the earth. But he also has a purpose in the heavens that he kept secret. And that's why he formed the church, the body of Christ. Satan never knew God was going to have an agency that could function in the heavens because all he had was the dirt man. Made out of earth. Restricted to the earth. And God kept a secret that he's going to form an agency that would not just function in here, but would function in the heavenly places and would do in the heavens what Israel, his earthly people, will do in the earth. And he's going to, he, the, the great plan of the Father is to exalt his Son. Focus everything in him. Make him the head of all. You know what your head does? It does the thinking for you. All of your life comes out of that. And he's going to be the head of all those positions of governmental authority, all those, all those creatures that run the government of heaven in heaven and in earth. He's going to have two realms and two agencies to accomplish one great purpose. Now, when you see that, there are three things that you learn when you study that verse that just come from it. Number one, it all starts with that basic distinction between the mystery and prophecy. God's purpose in the heavens and his purpose in the earth. What's God's purpose in the earth? We don't have time to go through all the verses, but you, you, you guys are intelligent enough. You know this stuff. He created man to do what? Go out and replenish the earth. Made him of the earth, earthy, to do that. He chose Abraham out, and he said, In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He brought Israel out of Egypt. And he said, I'm going to make you my people. You're going to be a kingdom of priests to me above all the people of the earth. 
Zechariah 14 talks about Christ coming back. I'm teaching that on Wednesday night in our assembly. Zechariah 14 is a thrilling passage. He says Christ comes back, destroys his enemies, goes into Jerusalem, and he sits there as the king of all the earth. And all the nations of the earth come to worship him. And righteousness fills the earth. Gabriel told Mary, that little baby is going to be born of you. He's going to be called the Son of the Most High. And he's going to sit upon the throne of his father David and of his kingdom. There'll be no end. That's what forever means, by the way. There'll be no end. The eon of the eons, the fullness of time, it's never going to end. You're going to be for the exceeding He's going to demonstrate through us the exceeding riches of his, of his grace in the ages, plural, to come. They're never going to end. Everyone's going to be bigger and better than the last one. I mean, it's a, it, I get excited about that. That's the future. But the purpose of it all is to gather everything under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not going, we're not gathered in one until we're gathered. So that basic distinction between God's purpose in the earth, His purpose in the heavens, is the issue of His purpose in the body of Christ. Listen, the basic fundamental tenet of dispensationalism is the distinction between Israel and the body of Christ. There's not one people of God through the Bible. There are two people of God through the Bible. There's this earthly people. Starts with a, it starts with Adam. It doesn't start with Abraham. It starts with the seed of the woman. It started with Adam in the garden. It's the seed of the woman became the seed of Abraham. But the seed of Abraham was through whom all of the earth would be blessed. So Israel is just his earthly agency to accomplish the exaltation of his son in the earth, then the body of Christ. Our destiny is to judge the angel at creation. Now that's a you know, that's an exciting thing. Well the brothers tell him he's listening to the, the studies on eternal glory. I drove out here from New Jersey. <laughs> Listen to that, and then he listened to eternal judgment, and he said, I think I need to go back and listen to eternal glory again. <laughs> I think listen to that and going back home, that, that'll change your life. That's the basic tenet of dispensationalism. That's the basic tenet that progressive dispensationalism misses. That's the basic tenet that, that people that reject dispensationalism miss. To understand the Bible, you've got to understand the difference between the Israel and the body of Christ, their place and their purpose. That passage requires a consistent literal interpretation because as Des said this morning, when you, when you spiritualize the Bible, you begin to tell spiritual lies because you don't have spiritual eyes. Earth means earth. Heaven means heaven. How do you define those terms? Take your Bible and let your Bible define the terms. Don't let a theology book do it. That's the reason I want you to get that, def that dictionary. Lord, it takes... What's that first word in 2 Timothy 2.15? Much study is in awareness of the flesh. It takes work. The Bible is the only book you'll ever read that I've ever found that people study the Bible by reading books about the Bible. You're not studying the Bible. You're studying somebody's book about the Bible. I'm a teacher. I produce stuff about the Bible. Listen, you want to study the Bible. You need to read your Bible. I tell our folks, if you read three chapters of Paul's epistles a day, you can read his epistles through in one month and have three days left over. Yeah, there are 87 chapters in Paul's epistles. Read three chapters a day and 29 days you'd read them. If you did that for six months, you wouldn't know yourself. Your head would be wanting to explode. You'd find out so much information that you didn't know. Just read Romans to follow. Don't read one book and then say, well, tomorrow I think I'll read another. Read them the way God put them in your book because that's where the edification process is. They're in there, that order for that way. So it's a, There's a spiritual order to the design of it. Don't go out and try to, well, so-and-so said you need to read it. No, Paul said read them this way. To so do it Paul's way. That's God through Paul tell you how to get it. And when you do it, you know what? God's word, the exceeding greatness of the power of his word works, but you've got to take it in. And when you do, you just have to believe it says what it is, let it define itself. So that second tenet of dispensationalism, first is the basic distinction between Israel and the body of Christ. There's in that. And the second is you just got to take the Bible literally because if you don't take it literally, you don't know what it means.
You just read the Bible in the normal, natural sense of its words, and not spiritualizing, not imposing some unrelated meaning to it. Otherwise, you're just left to the mercy of the theologians. Al Capone would be safer. <laughs> then he says, we're going to gather together in one all things, even in him. The goal. This, is the, this to me is the most important thing. The goal of it all is the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ultimate purpose of time and creation is the glorification of God's Son. God the Father believes that if you could see in His Son what He sees in Him, you'd love Him like He loves Him. And God's plan has one central goal, and that's the glorification of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why when you make the distinction between Israel and the body of Christ, between law and grace, between mystery and prophecy, you have to understand that distinction is not there because those things have no connection. They do have a connection, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's purpose, the reason for the distinction, is His purpose in His creation. If we had another hour, we'd go back to Genesis 1 and talk about why there's a heaven and earth, why that distinction, why there's a visible and invisible. There's a lot of information about that that you need to understand to grasp the fullness of it, but you can get it without all that. You just understand that's the creation, that's the way God, and in it all, His Son to be exalted. His plan is to accomplish that exaltation in two realms, the heaven and the earth, it's through two agencies, Israel and the body of Christ, and that's the essence of of Bible Christianity. That's the essence of what God's doing in His Bible. And not to see that is to miss the very basic issue that the Bible teaches. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all about the Father's plan, not your plan, not my plan, not some religious plan, the Father's plan to exalt His Son. And when you abandon that distinction between Israel and the body of Christ, that absolute difference between prophecy and mystery, when you abandon studying your Bible on the basis of what it says, that literal hermeneutic, they call it, and you begin to think it's about you, you see, your salvation is not the big deal. The big deal is the exaltation of His Son. Religion tells you the big deal is keeping you out of hell. That ain't the big That's a little, now that ain't a bad deal. I got saved December 31st, 1962. Pastor Roy Lange was our, my, my uh, Alabama history teacher, and he preached to us all year. If you knew Roy, you know that's all he ever did. He'd teach a little history and talk, talk Bible. <laughs> and I got saved over the Christmas holidays. I went back and began to, and told Brother Roy, I got saved. You know, Pastor Mr. Lange, I got saved. And he says, well, come down and study with me. And he put his arm around me and began to teach me the Bible. And I began to learn, wow, look at, look at who I am in Christ. Look at what I've learned. And I began, but you know, the reason I got saved was I'd gone to a youth camp as a kid that summer before that, and for the first time in my life, I ever heard I was lost. Nobody ever told me that before. And, dude, you can't get saved till you're lost. You're floating around on a boat and you're in good shape. It's fine, but when your duck t capsizes, then you need the life jacket. You know, the thing that just happened. I've ridden in ducks. I, didn't, I wasn't lost. I wasn't, wasn't in trouble. But you get lost, then you want to get saved. And when I realized, I'm going to go to hell. I spent six months every night. Now, Lord, I pray me down to, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Oh, Lord, don't let me die and I'll die and go to hell. Nobody told me the rest of that song, that, that, that little poem. If they had, I might have got it sooner. But the night I heard that faith was not me doing anything, but was just simply trusting what Jesus Christ did, I said, that's what I, and I believed it.
and God saved me. So it's a wonderful thing to pass from death to life, the joy. I know the joy, the excitement of having that happen after all that time. That's one. I'm not minimizing that. But when you see God's plan and purpose, that becomes ancillary almost. Because there's something so much bigger than just your salvation. He created you in Christ Jesus under good works which God before ordained that we walk in them. God's got this bigger plan, this cosmic plan to exalt His Son. And what He's done is given you the privilege to be a part of it. Woo, that's great. <laughs> That'd make a grace preacher want to shout. <laughs> Run an aisle maybe. No, maybe not. <laughs> I'm afraid I'd fall over us. Why? <laughs> but you see, the big stuff that you begin to understand is with the Father's plan to make His Son everything. And then you take your vision off of me and myself and I and all mine, and you put it on this big plan, and you look off to that, and you have that be your vision. And when you abandon a clear understanding of dispensational truth. You abandon the divinely prescribed method of gaining the profit from God's Word that He's put in His Word for your profit. And you give up the opportunity for the genuine, real, authentic working of the excellency, the power of His Word in your life in its details. You go through Paul's epistles and you See, Paul talked to people about what happens when they abandon what he teaches them. And you see them biting and devouring one another. You see them multiplying questions with no answers. You see strife of words to no profit. You see envy, strife, railing, evil surmisings, supposing gain is godliness. And you know what that describes? The condition of modern evangelicalism. You know that. That's where it comes from. Can I tell you that where you are, whether it's just you too and no more where you are, or whether you've got an assembly of people or an outreach to reaches thousands, that issue of the excellency of the power of God's Word working is put on display in your life. That's why I keep telling you, it isn't enough to be a mid-acts dispensationalist. When you know about Paul's ministry, you know the difference between the body of Christ, all you know, you're a good dispensationalist, but you're not a grace believer yet. Because Paul didn't just say it's, not, it's my gospel. He said it's my gospel. It's not just that it's not Peter's or not, not us. So it's, we get it through Paul, but you've got to get the message of grace that he teaches that produces the life that grace is designed to produce. He changed your identity completely and totally. You're baptized into Christ, into His death, into His burial, and you're raised with Him to walk in newness of life. And it's not the vain religious system. It's life in Christ Jesus that's the issue. You young people, you're facing a, an era. I live in sort of the transition generation from the old to the new. I don't know if I live long enough to see what's happening. I'm trying to train some people to face it. But if you're under 30 today, you're going to live in a Christian world that's different than anything we live in now because the world has turned on Christianity. And you're not the thinking process in our culture anymore like you once were like Christianity once was. You're living in a culture that can't even biblically define human personality, personhood. I've said for years the stuff about abortion is really an attack on personhood. You see it now. You have people that can't, you, you can't define marriage by a man and a woman. It started in the 60s and the 70s when you quit defining sexual relationships between, you began to say, sex should only be, the church began to teach, you should only have sexual relationships between men and women. No. Sexual relationships should only be between husband and wife. 
That's different. You understand the difference in that? So when you slide away, pretty soon they say, well, it should just be between people that genuinely love one another. And you can't, you, your culture can't even decide what marriage is. But it can't decide what humanity, what personhood is either. You can say, oh, there's a Target right over here. My wife doesn't shop in Target anymore because she's afraid she might take our granddaughters in there and some guy show up in the bathroom. You say, well, how's that? Because now you identify your person by what you feel you are. Listen, dude, go stand in front of a mirror after you take a shower, look at yourself, and you'll tell who you are. <laughs> That's called reality. Check your genetics. It'll be DNA. It's science. But your culture says you can define, you can defy all of that based upon the way you want to think. That is suicide in its most basic psychological sense. And you're living in a world that if you speak out against that, you're the enemy. You're going to have to figure out how to do it. You know what the church is doing? They're compromising with it because they, want, they think gain is godliness. Now, you folks that don't want to do that, I'm talking to the choir here. You want to do it? Have at it. But don't call it Bible. So I don't mind. You can believe anything you want to believe, teach anything you want to teach, just don't call it Bible. When you start calling it Bible, you're on my territory now. But you're going to go out and minister in a world and have to figure out how to do ministry in a world that is more like Paul lived in than what your ancestors, your parents lived in. Completely paganized culture. And don't worry about the politics and don't worry about the economics. You're not going to do anything about them anyway. Worry about your life and your ministry, your family and the people you minister to. And build them on a solid foundation of what God... Because listen, I don't know everything you're going to have to do, but I can tell you that God's Word living in you will give you the wisdom to walk through it in a way that honors Him. But you're going to have to be mature enough to be able to stand in the sufficiency of God's grace. God is able to make all grace abound to you that you might abound in every good work. I'm not quoting it right. You know 2 Corinthians 9, 8. You see, God's grace gives you the sufficiency to stand lacking nothing in every circumstance. But that's not going to be real in your life by you trusting your resources. It's going to be real because you trust His resources. By grace you say through faith that not of yourself. And that comes because you understand what God's Word says. Little, insignificant, nothings like us, as unknown, yet well known. I came to the realization years ago, and the conviction. People used to say, why, why is the grace message so, the grace group so small? Well, there's some practical reasons for that. The average church is never going to be more than about 60 to 70 people based upon group dynamics. You can only know about 60 or 70 people at one time, work with that many, and, and most leaders, most preachers aren't willing to delegate too much authority. If you're going to get more than 60 or 70 people, you're going to have to be willing to delegate authority. I understand all the group dynamics stuff. But if we were big looking... How does God's grace demonstrate its power? Paul said, my strength is made manifest where? In your weakness. When you look weak, we don't like that. We don't like to look insignificant. We don't like it to be us four and no more. We want it to be powerful and the world recognizes it. Paul said, it's in, my, it's in your weakness that my strength is made perfect. Do you follow that? That's the grace way. I'd rather have God's strength, the power, the excellency, the power of His Word working in my life, the Word working and energizing because I believe it, 
than to have all the other. You say, look at all that stuff you're missing. <laughs> I say, yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> I tell our guys, so you guys want to have more people come in the door. You know how people come in the door? Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I would have no luck at all. Come on in. <laughs> they bring, but you've got the answer. But you have to deal with it. Well, I'm through. What I want you to see is how important what you're doing is. And I want you to get your chin off your chest, get out of the doldrums, and understand that though you might appear small and insignificant to the adversary, you're not. And he's going to do everything he can to buffalo you and to go, boo, so you don't stand. Because that's what the armor in Ephesians 6 for is for you to stand and to withstand. And having done all to stand. The world, the church, they need you. God's will is that all men be saved. Take your little outpost of heaven where you are and focus on getting some people saved. You know what you'll find out there in the world today with the confusion and the crumbling of the religion of Christendom? For the first time, people even in those churches are willing to listen to you. You heard these brothers talk about the confusion of the Pentecostalism. There, there's an openness today that you've never experienced. You can keep beating on the heads of people that have told you they don't want it all you want to, but if you go next door, you might find somebody that wants it. What I've learned is if you introduce someone to Christ to get them saved, you know what they'll do? They'll let you teach the Bible. Somebody told me just today, said, nobody I know will let me teach them. Well, then go find somebody you don't know, share the gospel with them, and they'll, they'll come and ask you to teach them. Okay. I hope you understand what I'm trying to get across to you. Listen, this is important stuff, folks. The face of dispensationalism has changed tremendously, but the truth hasn't. And when you stand up for God's word rightly divided, you're doing exactly what God has for you to do. When you live your life under grace, not under law, in his resources, not your resources, and you're not out there just trying to please God, Tickle people's ears. You're out here trying to have Christ manifest in you, made manifest in your mortal flesh. You're going to try to get some people saved. And then those saved people know the knowledge, come to the knowledge of the truth. When that's where you are, you're doing what God has, what God's doing today. And that ought to be enough for all of us. Father, by the way, before we pray, let me say again. I've been preaching to the believers here and so forth. I love you. I appreciate you being here. I wouldn't try to beat up on you. Sometime I get into the, the mode of like I'm talking on the radio. I talk on the radio kind of harsh like that because I'm trying to get people to know I'm not saying like the, the guy right behind me. Most of the time they can tell because he's, he's really out there. But, uh, you know, you, you're trying to get You talk about Jesus, everybody thinks you're saying what they're saying. And I don't want people to think that. But listen, it's time, soldiers, you know, drill sergeants don't just go, would you please make up your bed? <laughs> it's okay. And if it ruffles your feathers, look at the verses. And go home and believe the verse. Don't pay attention to me. But if you're here tonight and you come in, maybe you came in with a friend, maybe you came in just to see what's going on, maybe you come in because you're a part of what we do, and you've never really trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never really been saved. You don't know for sure you have eternal life. Listen, I'm risking my wife's life, my, my wife's wrath here to talk to you. <laughs> and to say to you, you can pass from death to life tonight. And you don't have to have the confusion of the world and the unanswered questions that are out there. You can have the life, the light of life. 
because Jesus Christ was the light of all men, the life of all men, and the life, the light of men. And the entrance of thy word gives light. And you can trust him to do what he says. He'll save you. And no matter where you are, in the skull, you know, one to ten, wherever you're, the needs, the heart, the things you think aren't right, they aren't. Relax. Quit trying to make like they are. But just trust who God can make you in him. You trust him. And for those of you that are saved, let that be enough. Just be enough to be, to be in him. And let him be, and then let him live in your life where you are. Wow, I look out of this crowd and I see all these different people, different capabilities. And you think of Christ living in you, his grace manifesting himself through you and all where you are. The world couldn't contain it. So trust him. Trust his word. Let it be real to you. And as you do it, you'll get to the judgment seat of Christ and you'll look back and you'll say, whoa, look at what he did. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and your grace. And I just think, pray that these things we talked about might not just be talk, but might be reality. Because we trust your word to work your life in and through us for Christ's glory.